it's a privilege and honor for me to come and speak to uh, on this very important uh, subject. Um, I'm acutely aware that I am the only person here who does not know law, have not studied law, and uh, has never attended law lectures in my whole life. Uh, and yet I had the audacity as a near economist uh, to talk about such a subject. Uh, I take slight comfort that there have been many economists before me that had actually uh, studied the subject and written about it. Uh, the most principally Adam Smith, uh, who has lecture notes on jurisprudence that was not published in his lifetime, but subsequently um, uh, put together uh, based largely on notes of his students um, after his, his death. Uh, had he know about it, he would have prohibited it um, uh, from what I understand about his character. What I am going to talk about today is to discuss a, an economic theory. It's called the legal origins theory which has been developed only in the past 20 years. There has been a great deal of empirical research uh, to basically try to explain a lot of phenomenon, economic, social, political, uh, even value systems based on the origins of the two legal systems that exist in the world today. Um, <clears throat> That's the civil law tradition and the common law tradition, which basically covers all of the countries in the world with rare exceptions. And why that legal origin, the difference between the common law system and civil law system has been so pervasive for centuries, right? It's, it's, and I think the discussion that economists have have um, research in, in this area sheds considerable light, in my view, on the key subject today, and that is balancing security and freedom. The two legal traditions does have a different approach to how this is done. Uh, it is also correct to notice as during, at the present time, they are democratic and non-democratic political systems in each of these two um, legal traditions. They are civil law countries that are democratic, most notably France, and there are common law systems where it is undemocratic, most notably Singapore. <clears throat> so, um, Despite all this, what is the difference? Let me, this, in fact, the vast number of countries and people live under the civil law system rather than the common law system. Uh, within the civil law, there is the French civil law system, which is the most purest type. There's also the German and there is the Scandinavian. And of course, one could subdivide if one wishes, but I think that suffices. Most of these legal traditions, other than the English common law and the French civil law, uh, one could argue emerge indigenously in their respective countries. Otherwise, most of them had been implanted or transplanted, sometimes through conquest, sometimes through colonization. Uh, there are some who had voluntarily adopted it, notably in Northeast Asia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, and China had voluntarily adopted the German tradition. They, despite the fine distinctions between German, uh, uh, Scandinavian, and uh, the French systems, uh, empirical research conducted uh, over the last two decades have revealed that in terms of its impact on 
economic performance, economic systems, social behavior, uh, including even sometimes political systems, value systems, the different civil law traditions uh, have very little difference. They are quite similar, but there is profound difference between the civil law and the common law systems. Okay. This theory, the legal origins theory, started primarily uh, by focusing on studying the financial markets. It was noticed very distinctively that the most successful financial markets in terms of death, in terms of uh, breadth, uh, particularly if you look at, say, the stock market, uh, listed uh, entities uh, seems to be predominantly uh, have grazed the common law countries. There are no significant financial centers, particularly international financial centers in civil law countries. Yes, they're France, Germany, yes, Japan too, but they are primarily national financial stock markets rather than international. The great international financial centers, London, New York, Hong Kong, and to a lesser degree, Singapore, uh, are all in common law jurisdictions. The question then is why, right? Why? why? Surely Japan and France and Germany are economically very successful as measured by growth rates, GDP, GDP per capita, and so forth. Why is there this big difference? So economists started studying law, all right? This was the obvious empirical. And in studying, they expanded the applicability of the legal origins to a broader array of matters. The most important is the issue of analysis that um, <clears throat> in any system, how do you protect investors? What legal system provides best protection for investors, whether creditors or shareholders. And it has been discovered that actually the common law system gives greater protection for private property rights than civil law systems. That seems to be very well confirmed. The research is, is in great detail and I do not wish to dwell on it since I have only 15 minutes. Um, uh, but suffice to say, maybe hundreds of papers have researched to great details about, say, disclosures and IPO and so forth, right? To mark out the differences between civil law and common law traditions in terms of protection of creditors and equity investors uh, in terms of private property rights. A central requirement in the design of any national legal system, which ultimately has an important component of protecting uh, private property rights, is the protection of law enforcers uh, from being bullied with either violence or bribes by powerful local interests that are litigants. The higher the risk of coercion, the greater the need for protection and control of law enforcers by the state. Such control, however, also makes law enforcers beholden to the state and politicizes justice. There is therefore an inherent trade-off. There have been two inter two origins of why legal tradition in England and France had been different. The most well-known is the French Revolution that produced Napoleon and which began the codification uh, in what has now become the Napoleonic Code, which is, of course, a, a, a advancement over Roman law. But why did France adopt it? this elaborate codification of law 
in great detail to be enforced by royal appointed uh, magistrates. Uh, on the other hand, in England, the legal system evolved out of basically village justice, customary justice into jury uh, driven legal systems. Here comes the reductionist economists trying to understand this process. And the idea was, well, actually it really could go back not only to Napoleon, but also to the 12th and 13th century. England was much more peaceful compared to France at that period of time, when eventually legal systems began to evolve to its modern form. To cut a long story short, greater civility in England versus greater violence in France led to different legal systems. Well, it took hundreds of years to evolve, right? It didn't sort of start it overnight and then emerged. This is the economic, economist view of how it happened, right? It might be wrong, but as you know, economists are reductionist modelers and they like game theory and they have modeled it. Uh, the only defense is that they tested it against evidence and I think the evidence on the whole has held up pretty well. The, the idea then was very simple and actually goes back to Thomas Hobbes. The idea is you, when you fear, when you fear, right, your neighbor, then your emperor, then you would tolerate a great deal of poor behavior from your emperor. And that is what happened in France. In order to get justice in the French countryside, the most greatest threat to each individual and property rights was not the emperor's royal magistrate, but your neighbor, your local villain, your local bully, whether via violence or via bribes. As a result, in order to have justice prevail in the turbulent French countryside, France evolved civil law. Why detailed coding? Why not trust juries? Well, because how do you know that the magistrate that the emperor or king sent to far off villages was not bribed? Well, the only way to ensure performance is a detailed code that you do not allow your servant to deviate from. This is called in modern jargon, you know, key performance indicators, <laughs> right? In management language. It needs to be detailed and you are not permitted Therefore, as in common law, to interpret law via cases and precedents and see similarity where difference exists and differences where similarities appear. The judge is not free to deviate in court. Yes. And that is how the legal traditions had in the legal origins theory believe. What is the final outcome? It results in very different legal systems. The basic differences that emerge in these two legal systems is a very basic one. Common law rely on state prosecutors separate from judges in criminal cases. Civil law judge and prosecution are combined. 
common law rely more on precedents from previous judicial decisions than civil law. Common law require evidence to be presented to, shall, shall I exaggerate, illiterate juries. Civil law evidence is collected prior to trial and adjudication is a rehash of evidence in public. Review of judicial decisions by higher court is far more common in civil law because based on written reports of evidence, but less typical in common law. In civil law, reviews are automatic and serve to monitor performance of judges by the emperor. Common law decisions are made by juries. Common law rely on heavily motivated prosecutors to convict and precedent plays a very large role to remind judges and juries that where the law previously drew lines. Civil law countries at same levels of economic development have therefore less secure property rights. Greater government regulation and intervention, higher levels of red tape and corruption and less financially developed economies. Let me draw the consequence. Now, judicial systems deal ultimately with the most important matter, and that is justice. Goes as holy back as Plato. Therefore, whatever the legal system, common law or civil law, it needs to be predictable. That judge, judgments made should be made to last, not changed at will from time to time and from place to place. And that is why, whether it's a civil law or common law legal traditions, the institutions and the people they nurture to operate these legal systems have long lasting effects. Once you have a common law system, it is very difficult, if almost impossible, to overturn. And if you have a civil law system, it is also very difficult to change. In other words, legal systems are very persistent. They do not change. They cannot be easily overturned. Common law is much more about encouraging private contracting and resolution of disputes. Civil law is much more about state regulation of behavior. Civil law has emerged in systems, in situations of great turmoil. Common law has emerged under conditions of greater peace, stability, and tranquility. Is the common law better than the civil law for the purposes of having stock markets? Yes. But if your conditions are different, it is, no, it is no longer obvious that one system is better than the other. But having had one system, it is very difficult to abandon it or, or that system to be erased. It is long lasting. It is not fragile. It cannot be fragile. If it were fragile, it would not have been a legal system. So, Yes, one country, two system is a very complicated structure. It was created under a system in which Hong Kong has a common law system and the new sovereign that appeared in 1997 had a civil law tradition. Trying to marry the two is never easy. But if one were to understand the national security law, 
and why the sovereign became sufficiently upset and worried, that is certainly if we have to look at the origins of the two legal systems, and that is peace and tranquility became very wanting. And therefore, a much more civil law approach in the area of national security law to regulate social behavior has appeared. Yet by and large under the national security law, it is intended that much of it, most of it, it has been suggested and implied and, and certainly promised will actually have to operate through a common law system a system that will persist and last based on all the empirical research that we have seen uh, in the last two decades. And with that, I would say the attempt to balance security and freedom is important. But what is the freedom we are talking about? Again, here I refer to Asaya Berlin or for that matter, Benjamin Constant in the 19th century. There are two types of freedom. One is the individual freedoms, the civil freedoms, the economic freedoms that impinge on individual behavior, which Berlin calls the negative liberty. That is the freedom to do what each individual desires, not to be prevented from achieving it. But there's also a different type of freedom that Berlin talks about, positive freedom. And that is the freedom which is much more linked to a community, to a group, to a nation who wishes to achieve self-determination. That is not the freedom from intervention, from control, from regulation, but the freedom to achieve a collective political objective. And it is in this type of freedom, which easily transgresses into insecurity for the sovereign. So how do we balance the two types of freedom versus national security? One has to, in my view, particularly drawing from these two legal traditions, the type of freedom which is negative in Berlin's view versus the type of freedom or liberty that is positive. And I think in those two areas, uh, we will have to attain as with the great wisdom of the, the legal expertise and knowledge of our colleagues in the law faculty, to how to square the circle, or shall we say circle the square, um, in trying to embed common law, which does greater service in protecting individual freedoms in a civil law tradition that is where the sovereign is certainly very concerned about national security and feels sufficiently threatened. Uh, by aspirations for positive liberty. Thank you. <laughs>